Okay, hello. So welcome to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about proteins um, as described here, workers of the cell. So this is a pretty encompassing chapter. Obviously, we're going to be talking about protein uh, constituents, including amino acids, but we're also going to be talking about the different uh, forms in which they can appear within a given molecule. So for, for instance, uh, what does DNA look like, for instance? Um, or what is the general shapes? Uh, and we're going to be talking about such things as primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure, things like that. I uh, have a lot of great demos also in this chapter. So there's uh, three of them, and I highly encourage you to, to watch them because I think that this will help drive home the concepts that we're teaching here in this course, but also it will help you perhaps with the homework and definitely uh, the exam. So again, let's just refresh ourselves uh, about proteins. <laughs> about proteins, okay, they are uh, pretty essential as as you guys are well aware of, I mean, obviously they are a component of every cell in the human body. They are required at all stages of life for growth, development, and maintenance. So it's not just whenever you're young, it's whenever you're older too. Uh, helps body repair and build cells and tissues. It's a major part of skin, hair, nails, muscle, bone, internal organs. It influences blood clotting, fluid balance, hormone and enzyme production, vision, immune response. And it's usually found in association of vitamins and minerals, including all uh, the uh, B vitamins. Uh, choline, copper, iron, phosphorus, selenium, zinc, vitamins, D and E. Now, uh, the complete proteins actually contain all of the essential amino acids in adequate amounts. So animal foods such as dairy products, uh, eggs, meat, poultry, and seafood, those are complete protein sources. And this is something why it's important to uh, consume a bit of meat. Those that opt for a diet that isn't really meat or dairy friendly are going to have issues trying to get enough uh, protein and not only just generally general protein at, you know, as a general, like, you know, food nutrition group, but the complete proteins. And we're going to uh, show you that it's, it's about getting the, the proper um, amino acids, the incomplete proteins, um, meaning that they're missing, do not have enough of the essential amino acids. And then, of course, if you have complementary proteins, meaning that there are two or more incomplete protein sources that, when eaten in combination, maybe compensate for each other's lack of amino acids. For instance, grains are low in lysine, while beans and nuts, they are legumes, are low in the amino acid methionine. So when grains and legumes are eaten together, such as rice and beans or peanut butter on whole wheat bread, they form a complete protein. So this is this gives rise to some of the different combinations of foods. I mean, obviously, we... We think about foods that we eat and we try to get things that we like, maybe the taste profile, texture profile, things like that. But there's also a whole nother reason of looking at foods in order to try to get uh, the right balance of nutrients. I believe that peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, I mean, those things are so, it's such a simple <laughs> uh, preparation. It's, it's such a simple food, but actually that packs in a lot of the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins that are needed to help uh, provide nutrition. And then as a result of that, especially whenever we look at the complementary protein sources, they can actually provide those um, those amino acids that you couldn't get from any one of those ingredients separately. So it's pretty interesting that peanut butter and jelly, how simple it is. And, you know, it's, it's like that quintessential snack food or maybe uh, lunch, right, for, for a young, you know, child or even an adult. I mean, heck, I mean, I even, you know, for a long time, I was eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches just because it was the easiest thing to do. It took the minimal amount of time to prepare. I tried to get good bread, good peanut butter, good jelly. And I like to toast them, so that's even better. So uh, who knows, maybe I'm making you hungry. But uh, the whole point is there's ways of getting those uh, nutritional needs, you know, by combining different foods. We know that. So here are some important sources of the 20 standard amino acids. So, you know, you get these from food, uh, our bodies can only metabolize, or I should say, we can metabolize all the amino acids essentially if we were to eat them, but we can't make all of them. And we definitely can't make all the essential ones. So um, we're going to be looking a little bit closely here in, in the next couple slides, but just to, just to remind you where these essential and non-essential amino acids are gonna come from, look, they come from a variety of sources. So they even come from sources like grains and vegetables that also have a high, polysaccharide content. I mean, beans and peas also have that. And there might be a little bit of 
of uh, fats as well. Dairy products, eggs, of course, meats and poultry, nuts, seeds, seafood, soy products. I mean, there's there's a lot of different things. And usually, if one thing is going to be rich in in one type of food like the protein, you know, it could potentially have some benefits maybe for in the carbohydrate nutrition segment, like you know, like with the polysaccharides. So what about the proteins and how well do they digest in the body? Previously, I mentioned that with respect to the polysaccharides, if you don't have a lot of the amylase enzyme that can help break down those, that polysaccharide, uh, you know, uh, structure, that molecule that's usually found in like beans and other things like that, even in breads, things like that, then you can take, you know, that supplement and then that will help you digest it. Now, generally, and this is from a, a little while ago, but it was looked at the true, true digestibility of various protein sources. And you can see that eggs, milk, cheese, meat, and fish are really high, over 90%, as well as wheat and oatmeal and even peanut butter. The mixed US diet also has greater digestibility, like over 96%. But you can look here at beans, it's at 78%. So this is one of the reasons why, like Beano is called Beano, in order to help the digestibility, in order to breaking down some of the some of those um, you know complex polysaccharide chains, then you can use some amylase. So that's there. You also have rice, 88%, maize, 85%. Again, you, what you're looking at, the things that are going to be typically less than 90 are going to have a significant amount of polysaccharide character. So just as a as an idea there, in terms of uh, what you know, how well can we can we digest the foods? All right, so now we need to start talking about amino acids because Barry just introduced the essential and non-essential amino acid terminology. We need to talk about the amino acids and then we can move on and see, well, what is essential and what, you know, what do we make as humans? What can't we make? Things like that. Amino acids are amphoteric, okay? They donate and or accept protons. You can see that there's going to be an amide right? You see that there's an amine group here, the protonated amine, the NH3 plus is shown. And then you also have uh, the carboxylic ion also shown. So in the previous chapter on like acid base, we kind of introduced this with respect to having the two different uh, positive and, and negative ions that can exist in an amino acid. And it's going to be dependent upon what that pH environment is, whether they both exist together or whether you maybe have more of a uh, protonated amine structure existing relative to the carboxylate and of course vice versa. Know that the alpha carbon is denoted here that is attached to the protonated amine. That is always going to be denoted by the alpha carbon. So you have this carboxylate uh, grouping right here on the right hand side. I know that there's carbon there. Just ignore that carbon. Make like that's like the base zero. Like that's like the initial base camp of the molecule right? You see that carboxylic acid, that carbon is reserved for base. It's like the zero position, if I may. And then carbons um, leading off of that are going to be then term alpha, beta, and so on. So the alpha carbon is what we are referring to then with that first carbon after that um, carboxylic group. And it, in this particular case, you see that it's uh, attached to the to the protonated amine. So you can see the different structures here, alpha, beta, gamma, then be the third one. Uh, and that, and you can still see the carboxylic acid group there on the right hand side. Look at methionine, you know, you have this carboxylic acid group, but then you also have one, two, three, four total carbons uh, in that structure. You also have sulfur, and, and of course, you have the protonated amine. But that is just an example. The alpha carbon would be that uh, carbon that is directly attached to that carboxylic group. Okay. So, and you also have. For instance, in this uh, L amino versus D amino acid, again, we're just trying to take a look and see where where the arrangements are with respect to the carbons, right? You have carbon in the very center part, right? That would be considered the alpha carbon, the one right in the middle that has the branching out of the carboxylic group, uh, has the uh, amine, the, the protonated amine group, the R group for the rest of whatever that molecule is going to be, and then also the H. So that's just uh, an example of what we're looking at there. So how do you even figure out about these different uh, pH points, these uh, pKs of not only the protonated amine, but the carboxylate? I mentioned in the last chapter that you would look at um, the titrations, perhaps, in order to do these studies to try to figure out, well, where is the isoelectric point where there's balancing of each one? 
Well, you know, this is an example of one of the, of the titrations, pH versus the volume of sodium hydroxide. In this particular case, it's because you already have uh, 25 mils of solution of 0 0.1 molarity of glycine, okay, already in solution in your titrating sodium hydroxide. Obviously, you're going to have an indicator uh, present. You might even, uh, you know, depending on what on what you use, you may or may not use phenolphthalein, but, you know, these are the examples of it. You're, you'll be able to identify where the pH changes according to the volume of the sodium hydroxide in this particular case that is added. So, in the PK1, right, so this would be the glycine uh, amino acid, right, you have the carboxylic acid here, you have the PK1, it's 2.34. What, what are we even looking at there? It's right, it's not where necessarily this equivalence point where you all of a sudden the curve is going vertical, okay? That is where the, the isoelectric point will be. Whenever it absolutely goes vertical, meaning that there's a fairly large range in pH at a given volume of sodium hydroxide, meaning that more than one form can exist. So in, a, in other words, you might have more of a carboxylate or you might have more of the protonated mean. They're existing all within that range. How can there exist other things even at one volume? It's because of thermal fluctuations and whatnot. So you have micro environments that that reside and manifest a given solution and within that that can actually produce you know just some some subtle changes but that's why they also call it the isoelectric point for all intents and purposes then you have positive and negative both coexisting together that's the important point that you need to know so the pk here is going to be uh kind of like this inflection point so around you know it's maybe around 12 12 and a half uh mils of volume there of sodium hydroxide that was added, the pH starts to inflect, and that will be around 2.34. Okay, so that would be the first pK1 because obviously there's more than one hydrogen there that we're that we're considering. The second equivalence point is going to continue to um, to uh, arise, but look, that looks way different than the first equivalence point where you had a lot of negative and positive coexisting at the same point. The second equivalence point isn't really uh, mentioned uh, very much, and you know it's kind of short-lived. You have that inflection, and it occurs maybe around 50 mils and such. It almost looks as if it could be another PK environment, to be honest with you. But uh, it's not uh, technically. So the second PK environment actually is going to be, you know, just short of 40 mils, so around 38 or so. You're going to see this other, you know, change where the sloping starts to rise and a, in a little bit different format. And that is going to be right, you know, originating from the amine group then, this NH2 group. And so that's where that proton will arise from. So the PK2 there is around 9.58. How do you get to the isoelectric point? Well, they should, if you sum them, and then divide them by two, it's like the average basically get to that, you know, essential point 5.96. So again, there's going to be a bit of a range. You see that, but just by looking at this graph, <laughs> that even around that pH value of 5.96, like say for instance at pH 7, you can still have isoelectric behavior. If you have pH of 5, you still have isoelectric behavior. So it's still there, but technically speaking, if we had to reduce it to some kind of simple mathematical formula and say you didn't know what that equivalence point was, but you did know what the pK of the carboxylic acid group as well as the protonated mean might be, then you have uh, an, an easy mathematical expression to try to figure out what that isoelectric point is. So that was just a comment I just wanted to make as we move forward with the amino acids in terms of, you know, how the protons are going to be treated. So here, let's talk about nonpolar amino acids. There are three nonpolar amino acids that are synthesized by humans but are not essential. So this is pretty interesting. So we have all of the machinery to make these three nonpolar amino acids, but they're not considered essential. I think that that's pretty interesting. So we have proline, and you have a molecular model here. You also have the structure drawn out pretty clearly. And in this particular case, you know, it's not the skeletal structure. We have, we obviously have have these H's uh, present in the structure. And then we also have the charges also shown. So we're getting these structures. You have the ball and stick model, this 3D model. You have the two-dimensional uh, modeling here that also shows hydrogen bonds. And you also have, 
um, the hydrogen, not the actual hydrogen bonds, but the hydrogens attached to the carbons, obviously. And you have glycine with that, and then you have alanine. So all of these are important, but they're not considered essential. Our bodies can make these proline, glycine, and alanine. Notice that they're all nonpolar by virtue of the purplish boxed areas that are indicating where the nonpolarity substituent is arising. So in proline, you have this, this three carbon or this three methyl group here that's giving rise to nonpolarity. In glycine, you just have the single hydrogen. And then in alanine, you have the methyl group, just one um, providing that nonpolarity environment. Now, here are six nonpolar amino acids that are not synthesized by humans. But here's the catch. These are essential. What we mean by that is we have to then eat food in order to get these amino acids into our body so that our body can then, you know, utilize those amino acids to produce all the various proteins that make up our person. Okay. So here's another nonpolar one, isoleucine. And here's a four carbon hydrocarbon that exists as a nonpolar group that gives rise to the overall nonpolarity action. You might say, well, how is that all, you know, overall nonpolar? Well, we're assuming that the negative and the positive here balance each other, just like on the previous slide where you had the protonated amine and the carboxylic group coexisting. In this particular case, we're going to assume that all of that is balancing out. So there can't be really any electron density that's going to be pulled one way or another along that horizontal axis, okay? So that's where that is originating from. With respect to valine, look, this is also a three carbon system. Interesting, right? But the connection is different relative to uh, what we had there for proline. Here we also have leucine, four carbon. Again, the four carbon looks a little bit different than the isoleucine. So leucine is here, isoleucine is here. It's iso just by virtue of the connectivity, right, in which these are um, found, but those are nonpolar groups. Methione, right, you have still three carbons, but you have a sulfur uh, group right uh, in betwixt two of those methyl groups giving rise to sulfides, sulfide bonds, right? So that's also nonpolar. Now, even though it is nonpolar, there can be electrons still residing on sulfur, but remember those electrons are not participating in hydrogen bonding. You must have either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in order for hydrogen bonding to occur. So if you were going to draw out the Lewis structures here and, and, and map out all the electrons, you know, remember, that although there might be free electrons on sulfur, because it's in the same periodic group as oxygen, right? It's one of the chalcogens. It's in that group six. It'll have some lone pairs of electrons. Again, hydrogen bonding doesn't prefer to have sulfur as one of those donors or acceptors of the H bonds. Phenylalanine. Now we have an aromatic group, so now it starts getting a little bit bulkier. You guys know that that's going to be nonpolar. For sure and then especially if that's been expanded just a bit with another cyclic structure now though nitrogen is present and it could give some polar character i totally agree with that the issue is you still have that big aromatic molecule that's that's still attached there and you also have this conjugated uh, group here within that cyclic uh, structure with the nitrogen and at the end of the day you still have some methyl you still have hydrogens you still have some other groups that are, that, are, that are popping out there. Although, you know, nitrogen is present, it's not going to be able enough to be sufficient to overwhelm that phenol group. So this would trend more towards the nonpolar action. Okay, so all of those are essential. So we our bodies don't make them. We got to get them into our bodies. We do that through the diet or vitamin supplementation. Diet's going to probably be the best way. So here's some six polar and neutral amino acids, all but three amine, which is essential, are synthesized by humans. Okay, so you have cysteine, and this has a thiol group. You have an amine group here, right? And why is it an amine? Because you have a carboxylate or a carboxyl group here attached to the nitrogen. In fact, it almost looks uh, quite quite familiar to to some of the uh, peptide bonds that we'll be forming and that we'll be talking about this. So the amine group is going to be appearing again. But this is asparagine right? And then you have glutamine, you have tyrosine, you have serine, and you have threonine, okay? Or threonine, however you prefer to uh, 
to, to say that. So all of these, again, are synthesized by humans, but threonine is the only one that is essential. So that's why I kind of um, box that in red here. So all these other ones, tyrosine, serine, you know, serine, glutamine, the rest, they're still synthesized by humans. Uh, threonine is the only one, though, that is considered essential in this group. So what about the other <laughs> ones? Okay, we're trying to, to break all of these amino acids. Again, there's there's 20. Actually, there's a little bit more than 20, but, but the 20 um, pretty standard ones uh, that would be familiar to, to, mo to most plants and animals here are, you know, this is what we're discussing here. So you had three polar and basic uh, amino acids, meaning that these are positively charged. These are not synthesized by humans, okay? But these are essential with the exception of arginine. This is a kind of an interesting issue. So you have lysine and you have histidine. Both of these are essential. You know that histidine is used especially to help the formation of histamines, right? And then antihistamines, right, are then also, um, uh, you know, could be taken in terms of a like a like an over-the-counter medicine or prescription to try to may calm down the histamine behavior. But the histamines can't be made without the histidine. So that's just how <laughs> that kind of hierarchy goes. But these three polar basic amino acids are not synthesized, okay? So these must be incorporated by food sources, preferably. Arginine, okay, um, sometimes arginine is considered essential, but overall, the overall consensus is that it is not, all right? And, and so that's why I highlighted that in green. But lysine and, and histidine are definitely essential, and they are polar and they are basic. How are they polar? Well, they have the protonated amine, you know, hanging out after the one, two, three, four carbons here in lysine, that's a protonated structure. You would also call that a basic environment. And then with respect to the cyclic nitrogen structure, now here all of a sudden, remember whenever we had the other structure with the phenyl group and it wasn't polar enough, here in this particular case it is charged, we would call that a basic, um, you know, molecule just because of that positive charge, and this then is, is polar. The arginine also is polar, but this time we have a carbon-nitrogen double bond. How interesting, right? We haven't really seen that. And in addition to that, you also have two other nitrogen groups that are, that are about that carbon. So kind of interesting there, all the different structures. So you have two polar and acidic ones. You have aspartate and glutamate. Okay, so these are going to be talked about uh, in, in our body, right, these are synthesized by humans. These are polar. Why are they polar? They have a negative charge here. They are acidic. They have that carboxylic looking uh, form. It's a carboxylic group, right? One of them has a couple more carbons attached to that carboxylic group than the other one. There's the glutamate that has relative to the aspartate. But we would consider these, aspartate and glutamate, instead of the actual true form. If, they're, if they were neutral, it would be aspartic acid and, and glutamate acid, right? So, but they're not. So they're acidic, they're polar, and especially as they reside in the body, that's just how it is. So uh, you have in this uh, table that, or these images that I'm showing you, you have some pKa values, right? You have the pKa here of this one carboxylic group, which is 1.95, really low, and you have another one where there was already the loss of the, of the proton. That would, that would correspond to that carboxylic group in purple, the one way down here that has the pKa of 3.7. Again, um, you know, and that was for aspartic acid, so it's going to exist as aspartate. So it's kind of interesting, although they list it as, a, as aspartic acid, truly it's a negative in nature, right? It's the aspartate form. It is negatively charged, right? It is polar. That's just the form. For glutamic acid, it's actually going to be glutamate, I mean, if we're going to be pedantic about this. And the carboxylic group is uh, in purple in the upper part of that cartoon is now listed in the very bottom. That pK is 4.15, while the uh, pKa of the carboxylic group that is uh, in the in the um, backbone, I guess if you want to call it that, of this of this glutamate amino acid along that uh, horizontal axis has a pKa of 2.16. So a bit different because of the different substituents that are there. So if you were to look at 21 acids, remember I mentioned that, you know, there were 20, this selenocysteine, and I highlight this in green, that's considered non-standard, 
okay? So it's not really found in genetic coding. Could it be? Well, yeah, you can infuse that. In fact, some scientists do this whenever they're trying to pursue a certain course of research, they might put in some kind of non-standard amino acid and non-natural amino acid in order to try to, I don't know, tease out a certain kind of product that if they've, you know, genetically modified a bacterium to express a certain molecule, then that's what they might want to do. But, um, but those are the 20. So went through them, uh, looked at them again, spent some time on that. Um, those, you know, there's going to be a wealth of them, obviously, involved in all kind of protein formation. But, you know, here, I just want to highlight those nine essential amino acids that are required for diet. So in this table here, and this is from, um, this, is, this is data based on WHO data, um, uh, a lot of different, uh, ag, you know, data points from, from indi individual uh, researchers. And this is in the reference of RDA. It's the uh, 10th edition, the recommended daily allowance. So you can always click on that. There's a hyperlink. And that will take you to this. It's a whole bunch of different uh, information that could be useful to you. If we're looking at the amino acid and we have nine of them, and then we look at all of the requirements in milligram per kilogram per day. So um, back whenever we were talking about solutions and whatnot, we introduced some different forms of concentrations. This was one of the units that we had introduced was the milligram per kilogram. And that was almost given as a PPM kind of, kind of uh, uh, nomenclature. So we did talk about that. We talked about that with respect to toxicity, for instance, like how much lead there, there might be in, I don't know, I mean, um, in food, right? I think that was one of the tables that I had previously shown you. It was uh, denoted with units of milligram per kilogram. Here we're talking about amino acids. So uh, we're using milligram per kilogram because these are these are relatively small. So here would be the one, to, one through nine amino acids that are going to be essential. And these are basic requirements given for infants aged three to four months or children, about two years, children between 10 and 12, and then adults. Okay. So you have the differences there and notice that you don't have arginine present. Okay. So in the course of your, of your reading of your book and stuff, you might find that arginine is sometimes listed as an essential one, but technically, I mean, this is from compiled data that has gone back from you know, for a long time now, even prior to 1964, that you're getting data here that shows that you're typically considering uh, the amino acids to be nine of them, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, plus cysteine, alanine, plus tyrosine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. Okay, so just wanted to throw that out there. Now, I'm going to throw out this, this, this pretty um, <laughs> aggressive looking circle, right, that has all of these kind of decorations. This is a massive cartoon. You know, what this is, is, and if you were going to do any kind of, I don't know, molecular biology, maybe even some biochemical stuff, you would probably see some of this kind of cartoon-like um, symbology, I guess, where you have a bunch of different things all mapped that are trying to describe what is going on with a given microbiological system. So, what we mean by that is this could be the metabolic pathways. It could be transport mechanisms. We already learned about some of those transports, and I'm sure you're getting a bit of that perhaps in your physiology where you have active transport, you have passive diffusion, right? You have the production of different carbohydrates. Whenever we get to chapter 12, we'll be talking a little bit about the citric acid cycle. Uh, here, you know, you have a lot of action going on. I don't want to overwhelm you with this, and, you, and, and you're not – you know, going to be responsible for knowing all this, but why I want to introduce this, this is from one of the karyogenic oral bacteria that reside in our mouth, and it's called Streptococcus mutans. In fact, many people believe that it is the number one assailant for uh, causing dental decay. And I only half agree with that because uh, Streptococcus mutans, while it's, it is especially prominent in those that have cavitations or cavities in the mouth, it doesn't uh, it's not the originator, I guess, of that caries. Usually there's some other bacteria that it cooperates with, and those other bacteria, like lactobacillus, is especially um, adept at forming the initial pocket in which, you know, other bacteria could then start to uh, colonize and, well, do their damage. But anyway, 
this is one of the reasons why there was re there is and there continues to be. I mean, this you know research on Streptococcus mutans is now almost approaching at least 100 years, I think, in terms of trying to figure out well how do you control this. But what's why I want to show you this is that this is why it's it's pretty impressive. I call it beast. But look at this. It can synthesize all of its amino acids, and we're going to count the amino acids here because they reside in this in this uh, disc in the circle. But remember, we need essential acids as human beings, and we can't even synthesize all of our own essential amino acids. We have to supplement through diet. So just in contrast to that, we have bacterial species that reside in our mouth that are powerful enough, that are robust enough, that they can synthesize all of their own amino acids. I think that's pretty impressive. So let's just take a look at some of them here. And we can count a little bit if you want to. So you have um, serine that is produced, right? So that's one. You have glycine, two. Cysteine, three. You have uh, phenylalanine, four. Tyrosine, five. Tryptophan, six. Aspartate, seven. Lysine, eight. Methionine, nine. Threonine, ten. Asparagine, right? There's 11. Arginine, 12. Glutamate, 13. Proline, 14. Alanine, 15. Right, and it actually, um, yeah, I'm sure I'm probably missing uh, something in here. I don't know, maybe that's it, but we have at least 15 amino acids that that this single um, bacteria, the one that's responsible for, for the progression, not the creation of the decay, but the progression where the acids eat through your enamel and into your underlying soft structure called the dentin, which helps support the tooth and protects the nerve and, and all that other stuff, that's where it really begins to, you know, to reign supreme. Get this, it's not about just being able to stay away from sugar because this beast metabolizes more carbohydrates than any other gram-positive pathogen, okay? So, you know, uh, there's a variety of different um, pathogens that are gram-positive, like, uh, like staph, right? Um, I, you know, I don't know if you know about the difference between gram positive and gram negative. Gram positive just have a very thick protein based um, cell membrane. And so these are generally harder to destroy than gram negative bacteria. And so, and these, that's one of the reasons, especially with some of the different makeup of that cellular membrane, why gram positive bacteria are a little bit more hard to deal with, especially in a, in a, in a, in a hospital setting. If you're going to have infections, it's going to come from, um, from gram positive bacteria. Anyway, look at all the different carbohydrates that it can synthesize. So look at this box here, this PTS14 on the left hand side, where you have, it first starts with glucose. You have glucose, you have sucrose, you have lactose, you have fructose, you have mannose, cellobios, trailose, glucoside. Here's an interesting, a sugar alcohol, mannitol. You also have some sorbitol. Okay, those are supposed to be non-fermentable by most oral bacteria. Those would be good sugar substitutes if somebody was interested in having something that maybe, you know, wasn't going to help lead to dental decay. But those are a lot of different, you know, saccharides, carbs really. And you can see that some of those are going to be originating from milk. Some of those are going to just be originating from simple table sugar, some of them from fruits, right? It's really interesting that this can do that. And one of the other noteworthy things uh, about this is that within this architecture here, uh, within this you know whole you know um, I don't know uh, description of all of the functionalities, you have you have different things like here you have an oligopeptide, and uh, I'm trying to think of anything else within this membrane. I, I don't think it does as good because it can't list everything. But just to let you know, there's an abundance of proteases, peptidases, and exoenzymes, meaning meaning that this pathogen requires host tissue to thrive. And not only, and I'm not talking about host tissue like bones or teeth, because that's calcium and phosphate rich, but I'm talking about the soft tissue. Remember how we said that protein like skin, um, all of our elasticity, a lot of that's been able to, you know, to be made possible through the collagen, through those fibros, through the proteins, basically. And our dentin is no different. It's also made up of a lot of uh, protein-based components and the fact that this pathogenic beast can can metabolize 
most sugars, it can synthesize all of its own amino acids, but it can, but it also expresses an ent a huge range of uh, proteases, peptidases, and exoenzymes. Well, that just means that you know it's once it's there, it's going to want to you know sit there for a while and enjoy life, uh, much to our own uh, demise, I guess. Well, our tooth's demise. So just want to let you know that just for comparison purposes, uh, I think it's important that we keep things in in perspective about the about what is out there, what we are commonly you know dealing with, and and what our you know human limitations are. I mean, we can't synthesize all the amino acids we need. Um, and then I'm going to say one thing else about Streptococcus mutans. Even in the in, in the face of all of this activity, the very one agent that can help control its behavior is fluoride. That single fluorine uh, ion, fluoride, one of the, the most electronegative element, right, is can singly suppress the action of Streptococcus mutans. And it can do so at a pretty low level. So this is another reason why it's important to brush your teeth with fluoride, because it can help mitigate some of the damage that can be done by virtue of all the machinery that this bacteria has. All right. So let's go back to the classification of amino acids. So we still have all of these amino acids, and this is something that we're going to have to um, try to get used to. We're going to be revisiting this, especially whenever we see the next chapter, which is about nucleic acids and stuff. But you're going to see these one-letter codes, right? Uh, cysteine, histidine, isoleucine, you know, all the way down. You have all of these different one-letter codes. You have all these different three-letter codes. We're going to be looking at these again and again and again in the next chapter. Not all of them, because not all of them are super important. But you can see in the second grouping here where it says the most common amino acid that starts with the letter, you have A, G, L, P, T. A lot of those are what we're going to see in the in the DNA composition. So we're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll be coming back to that. But, you know, do you have to memorize these? No. I mean, these are, you know, a whole bunch of different coding. If you were around this quite frequently, then of course you would. And actually, it would just become part of your vernacular. But at the moment, you know, these are what these are based on. And it's a little bit kind of, you know, helter skelter where some of those one letter codes are coming from. Like if you go all the way down to aspartate, you have ASP, then you see the one letter code D. <laughs> well, there's no D even in that name, but they say, well, maybe it sounds like, I don't know, aspartate. Uh, to me, that's pretty weak, <laughs> but that is the convention. That is what people do. So that's what we're going to have to continue on with. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's any other weird one. I mean, glutamine is obviously a, a weird one because it has a Q, even though there's no Q in the structure. So, and lysine has K because, you know, why K? Well, K is near L in the alphabet. I mean, I think that that's pretty weak, but it, hey, if it makes sense, I guess, to all those that, that now have, uh, have, have worked and or continue to work, then so be it. But uh, just an, an interesting tidbit there. So, all right. Let's work through an example and figure out what we're doing. So here we have an example. We need to provide the name and the three-letter and one-letter abbreviation. So here's the amino acid structure. This is phenylalanine. We can just go back, look at the table, understand that the phenol is probably going to come from that aromatic group, which is also known as a phenol group. <laughs> so no surprise there, all right? And it has alanine structure as well. If you go back to the table, you would just look and say, okay, what is the three-letter code? It's the PHE for phenylalanine. And it's also denoted F for the one letter abbreviation. Why F? Because phenyl sound, you know, phonetically sounds like the word, you know, uh, F, right? If you were to say that, like, you know, whatever, Frankfurter, I don't know, fluoride, how about that? So you can identify the side chain groups. You got the phenyl group, of course, right? And you have, you know, the air, the uh, single methyl group, right? With the, with the hydrogen there are the side chains polar neutral, polar charged, or nonpolar. You guys know that this structure here, this phenyl group is going to be a nonpolar, right? So that's what that's going to be. Especially, you know, you would never consider, you know, a hydrogen group also to have any kind of polarity like there. So that's like, so that would also be considered nonpolar. Are the side chains hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Well, if they're polar and then they're going to uh, likely then attract, but if they're nonpolar, they're going to repel. So you're going to have a hydrophobic environment. All right, so phenylalanine, this would be an example of that, trying to give the name, three-letter, and the one-letter abbreviations. We got the side chains. We're trying to denote where those groups are and then what the polarity is, and that helps us with its um, either repulsion or attraction of water, okay? 
So here's another example. So again, we would just go back through, look at the different structures, okay? It, you don't have to necessarily know these, right? Because there's there's 20 of them. And moreover, you know, nine of them are essential for our human, you know, existence. So, uh, you know, trying to know all those different ones can get a, a very difficult task. And the scope of time and everything else, it's more important you can identify that this is an amino acid by virtue of the protonated amine. You can look at the carboxylic group. You can recognize that there is going to be some differences then based on those side chains that are popping off, knowing whether they're polar and whatnot, and knowing that this is an amino acid, you can then cross-reference and try to figure out what that is. Well, this corresponds to serine, okay? The three-letter abbreviation would be SER, S-E-R, the one letter, S. Make that easy, right? They identify the side chains. Of course, you still have that CH methyl, you know, hydrogen, but you also have the hydroxyl group, okay? That hydroxyl group can also participate in what kind of bonding? Hydrogen bonding, right? Oxygen. Um, if you have, the, you know, the oxygen with the lone pair and then you have the hydrogen present, you know that's going to be a default hydrogen bonding environment. That's going to be able to accept some hydrogen bonds um, and and uh, potentially, you know, give it up there uh, depending on what kind of, you know, situation that you, that, that the serine is in. Obviously, if it's in a water environment, it's going to be able to do that. This is a primary alcohol, right? Because you have uh, only, you know, the one carbon popping off, you have the two hydrogens on either side. If there was, instead of CH2, if it was only CH and then there was another carbon popped off from that, then that would be a secondary carbon, right? So it's uh, the primary because there's only, you know, instead of having three hydrogens, there's, there's two. So with one short, then that becomes the primary. You know then that it's, you know, it's going to be polar to some degree, right? It has the hydrogen bonding, so it can't be nonpolar. Now, it's going to be polar charged or polar neutral. The fact is, there are no positive or negative charges here. So that's going to be what I would consider to be polar neutral, all right? Because there are no charges present on that hydroxyl group, right? I know that the protonated amine and the carboxylin on the right and left side, right, of this amino acid backbone, quote unquote, if I may you know, have those, but that's not where the polarity is arising. Whenever we're talking about it, we're always talking about it with respect to the side chains and the hydroxyl group is polar neutral. And it's going to be hydrophilic just by virtue of the hydrogen bonding that it can participate in. All right, so I think those are pretty good examples going through, talking about what that might be. We are going to revisit condensation reactions. And we have already done this quite a bit. You guys already know about this. If you combine a carboxylic acid with an alcohol, you get an ester, and then of course you get water, okay? If you go the opposite way and you do hydrolysis, well, then you're gonna, it's gonna use water, right? And you're gonna break down, for instance, the ester into a carboxylic acid and alcohol. So that's just standard stuff. This is also part of what we had already talked about in some of the other um, you know, webinars, uh, definitely in, in chapter uh, seven and eight, going with respect to the triglycerides and the phospholipids, right? So the triglycerides, that's basically the, uh, the fat that exists. Well, we would call it oil, like if it's an olive oil, because it would have a, this liquid-like um, format, this liquid phase, the triglycerides do uh, in the oil. But then if it's processed into a fat, which would be, you know, combined, for instance, with like, um, here, well, I'll just show you, with, with glycerol, then that can actually make uh, this kind of uh, ester, right? This fatty acid ester that is also essentially what we have in our bodies as we store our fat, we have, you know, basically esters, right? If we're talking about cellular membranes, we're talking about phospholipids, right? So that's where one of those fatty acid tails is replaced with this organic phosphate head. Okay, and well, and it's and it's ionic, so that's giving rise to the to the to the phospholipid, and that helps to also create the cellular membranes. So just remember that this is what we're doing. We're going to be talking about this because the condensation reaction, because we're going to be trying to, to form proteins, and proteins are formed through the combination of amino acids, or, or in other words, the reaction of multiple amino acids. Okay. So you guys already know that. Again, the opposite of condensation would be hydrolysis. So that's not a problem. So where else did we see this? We also saw this uh, with respect to um, the uh, saccharides that we were that that we were dealing with, right? We had the aldehyde, we had the alcohol. This is whenever, for instance, a straight chain would actually form a cyclic structure, right? The hemiacetals, 
were involved in this cyclic structure, which is also known as a ring, right? So we also did that. But what about the glycosidic bond um, between monosaccharides? Whenever you have um, multiple ones that are forming, right? You have that. And here's you have like the two, the two uh, saccharide units versus the monosaccharide units, right? So you have this disaccharide that forms again through that glycosidic bond. So even with respect to, you know, the ring formation of just the single um, uh, saccharide species, of course, if you were to add another one, like another saccharide species, and then they'd be able to react through a condensation process, meaning that water is going to get evolved, well, then that's another form of, well, condensation. You're making, you know, it's a synthesis reaction, right? Whereas hydrolysis is decomposition. So again, it's just, we're just following the same kind of framework, the same kind of machinery that we use to describe the uh, different fatty acids that we use to describe these uh, saccharides that we use to describe even the, uh, you know, the formation of esters from, from carboxylic acids and alcohols. And now we're doing it with proteins. So how do we do it? Well, you have a carboxylic acid and you have the amine and whenever they're an ionic form, right? The carboxylate with the protonated amine, guess what? They're going to form that amide bond. So that peptide bond formation then forms because it's the result of the condensation reaction. Water is also then formed. The two hydrogens are going to pop off that amine group and it's going to react with the oxygen from that carboxylic group and water will be produced. Uh, obviously, enzymes are going to be involved in trying to, to create these peptide structures. These reactions just can't happen <laughs> naturally, right? So enzymes are going to be required for these amides uh, to be created, these bondings to create. So it's no different. So you have a carboxylate plus a protonated amine creates a dipeptide plus water. That's the general framework then of this condensation to form a peptide molecule. So what is a peptide? <laughs> a peptide, anyway, is going to be at least uh, two amino acids, right? If it's going to be a polypeptide, then you're going to have more than two. If it's just going to be two, it's going to be a dipeptide. Can you have a monopeptide? No, because then you're just left with, I mean, that's no different than just having an amino acid, okay? So that's the difference. And it makes sense that, that, the, that that's where the bonding would occur because you have negative and positive being attracted to one another. It's kind of like a salt, right? The sodium chloride, you know, I'm not talking about in water. I'm talking about just sodium chloride. Sodium would be attracted to chlorine. Well, guess what? Amino acid two here with the amine group in this cartoon here is going to be attracted to the amino acid one here that has the carboxylic group. So that's it. The opposite of condensation then in this particular case would then be hydrolysis. So there is no confusion there, uh, or there shouldn't be, over, over what's going on. Now, talking about hydrolysis, we call it then protein busting. Why is this, you know, even important? Well, the foods that we eat, again, we mentioned that we need all those different types of foods in order to get amino acids into our body, because we cannot make all the essential amino acids that we need. So we need to have that machinery in order to bust those peptides those proteins, okay, especially if they're poly, more than more than two, right? That's going to be necessary so that we can rearrange those those protein subunits or those amino acids or even groupings of those peptides into something that's going to be more useful to us, okay? And of course, plants do this, and and other animals do this, uh, you know, bacteria do this. So it's not just something obviously unique to us. So you have the dipeptide. This is alanine, alanine, okay? Ala, ala. Sounds sounds like we're we're going indigenous here, I think, and we're having fun, or maybe we're in Hawaii or something, and we're, we're having fun. Doing, you know, there'll be a luau, right? And we're going to bring the ala ala with us. I don't know. Who knows? But we have protease that can help uh, break down this type of dipeptide. Guess what? Remember how I talked about the S-mutans, streptococcus mutans, having a lot of protease? And other kind of uh, protein busting machinery available? Well, we have it too, and it would be an example of of being able to do this. So it would have this enzyme that can that can bust this molecule at the place where you're going to have then the carboxylate form and the pronated amine form, right? So it's going to be, you know, well, you have to ask yourself, where is it going to be? And, and how is it going to be formed? You still have, if we look at this dipeptide, right? We have the uh, negative on the right side, we have the positive on, on the far left. 
we have to look and see where that bonding is going to be busted. And you know that water is going to be important. So water is going to be making its way into, into this dipeptide and it's gonna be introduced at that dipeptide linkage, okay? At that peptide bond. Where's the peptide bond? That bond exists between the carbonyl carbon and the nitrogen that is directly next to it. It is not the carbon that is fully saturated, meaning it has this methyl group here, it has another carbon group. In other words, it's not tetrahedral in shape, right? The carbonyl group is trigonal in shape, right? And it's bonded to that amine group immediately next to it. So that is the environment. We have this trigonal, trigonal shape, not trigonal pyramidal, okay? So again, the trigonal is coming from the carbon oxygen double bond. The, the trigonal is coming from the amine group, okay? And that's where the reaction is going to occur, all right? So that's just what happens. So that's how it's busted, all right. We will stop there, and I will be talking a bit more about peptides and proteins, and we're going to be introducing all the different structures. And I think that this is going to be a pretty good, a pretty good place uh, to, to introduce all the different, uh, you know, things that are very familiar to us, like uh, fibers and muscles, and and even the dentin we're going to be talking about. So just stay tuned, and we will be coming back.